Welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Creativity. Here's how to get unstuck. I'm your host, creativity coach, Nancy Norbeck. Let's go. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a way to hang out with me online. If there's one thing I know for sure, it's that when ordinary people engage their creativity, they connect with their joy and their deepest selves come to life. I've started a newsletter called The Spark. It's a place for me to experiment with my writing and share it with an audience and also a place to get to know you better. I'm using the Substack platform because it offers some really cool ways to connect with readers, including comments and chats. I'd love for you to join me as we form a community that supports and celebrates each other's creative courage. Because it's an experiment, you never know what sort of thing I might share on the Spark, and honestly, neither do I. Could be my thoughts on something I've noticed recently, a poem, a response to a photo or a piece of music, or just something completely unexpected. It's always accessible, always personal, and usually has something to do with creativity. The Spark is where I'll be adding programs for subscribers and listeners too, so you really want to be there to hear what's happening. It is totally free to subscribe, and you can find a link to The Spark in your podcast app. So sign up today. I can't wait to see you there. What's it like to doubt the beliefs of the strict religious community you grew up with? What's it like to leave? Where do you find the courage and strength to make that choice and to adapt to your new life? Director Scott Homan and writer and musician Ryan Sutter have lived these questions and collaborated to tell the story in the new documentary, Witness Underground. The film focuses on Ryan's love of music and the musical relationships within the Jehovah's Witness community that sustained him as a teen and gave him a safe place to land when he left. We talk about all these questions and the process of making the film, which is now running a Kickstarter to fund distribution to popular streaming services. I think you'll find a lot to think about in this conversation with Scott Homan and Ryan Sutter. Scott and Ryan, welcome to Follow Your Curiosity. Thanks for having us, Nancy. I really appreciate it. So Good to meet you. <laughs> you too. So I start everybody out with the same question, which is, were you a creative kid or did you discover your creative side later on? So I think Scott will start with you. I had some experiences with creativity my my mom was a saxophone player so she got me into band early in fifth grade so there was that which is a nice intro to like how to read music and speak the language of music at a basic level and painting and there was always some kind of and cooking even she's an amazing baker and cook so uh, i learned a lot from in those ways and my dad's like a creative um, engineer mind where we'd like sketch something on the table and we go weld it in the garage and build like a machine or like change it take an engine off of a different machine and like create something else. And so you're always kind of like, well, how could we use this thing and make it? And so there was a lot of that kind of inventive mindset in flourishing in that house growing up. My brother played drums and my little brother played drums. Like, so I had like music around and I play guitar early on. So making music, doing covers and creating new things and noise and, and whatever we wanted was a big part of our growing up experience. That's really cool. I love that you mentioned your dad's engineering. My dad's an engineer, and I think they don't get enough credit for being creative people because it's like they have practical applications. So that must not be creative because it's not an art, but it yeah. really is. Yeah, it's like applied physics. It's like, well, how, yeah. this is how the universe works. Let's try to adapt that. Let's extract energy from this thing or something. It's really yeah. interesting. It's really cool. So it sounds like it was a, a pretty creatively supportive household. To the extent that, and I guess Ryan and I both have a similar thing with this. My, my parents ended up buying the house next door when the neighbor died and the, the family sold the property. My parents just wanted to like get more property, but it had a house on it. And they were like, yeah, you guys can use it for whatever you want. We made a, we start, we were making music. So we put all our instruments. They were happy to have a place for us to get rid of the drum set and the guitar and the distortion. And, the, <laughs> and so we went over there and we like invited all of our friends. So we had this like music studio throughout our entire teenage years in high school. And it went on for a couple more years. We ended up living in the studio, but it was like the whole county's worth of musicians had their music, music equipment there. We recorded albums there and it was a lot of fun. We threw parties and hosted oh, live God. music events. That is so awesome. That must have been like your own little private paradise. It was. It was great. <laughs> and they never really bothered and um, they were happy to have us be gone. <laughs> so had five kids. So like half of them are over there making noise far away. It was like the dream <laughs> situation for them. Yeah, we don't have to listen My to parents would have loved that. 
the drum set was right below the bedroom in our place. Oh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so then how did you go from music into doing film work? Another special thing about Wisconsin where I grew up was that they had a really, really well-paid um, arts program throughout the whole state, throughout the 80s and 90s especially. <clears throat> so we had a documentary film program a photography darkroom program as a part of an elective you could take. And like we could, we had all access pass to get out of any other class to do documentaries. And so that was like a lot of the guys, a lot of my friends that did that with at that same time as me, including my little brother later, um, kept on making, made it into a business using film. So like it created, created this incredible open exploration of the medium of film and media video. And so when I, I went up, ended up going to photography school after that and worked in TV news, camera and audio. So like I had this break where I went to engineering school as well and did intellectual engineering. And then at some point I was like, I love storytelling. If I'm going to like, if I'm going to do whatever, what was the thing I want to do with my whole life? Like if I, if I can focus on that thing and I went back to focusing on storytelling and documentary, especially and music videos, like music's a big part of my storytelling. And I think I realized that musicians, like I'm, I play music and I write my own music. I used to more, um, but I realized like most people that are doing that are really, really good at it naturally. And for me, it was always felt like a hobby that had like a ceiling that I kept hitting. Mm-hmm. I didn't really care as much. But I cared about capturing other musicians who are amazing, and I respect the hell out of music and musicians. Um, so I focus on telling their stories and working with musicians, and th- like that's a deep tie for me is the music and, and film. I have another film that came, that came out a couple of years ago about Hanoi music scene because I lived in Vietnam where I kind of explored music and, and documentary there deeply. That must have been an interesting setting for that. Yeah. I think you could go anywhere in the world where it's like a different culture and mm-hmm. just be like fascinated, freshly fascinated with humanity because it's totally different culture and do something similar. But I kind of was surprised that there was like a really interesting international music scene in that capital city of like 6 million people. Um, it was kind of small, but also like it was easy access to everybody. And everybody was so stoked to have someone making a video for them. And um, they became my best friends there. So that was like a fun kind of go back to my roots kind of situation. Back in high school, I was making documentaries and music videos for my friends and my own band. Um, I was doing that again as an adult, but like taking it more seriously. Did did you deliberately choose Hanoi for that reason, or did you discover the music scene after you got there? I discovered it after I got there. I think I was kind of desperate for like the feeling of home, and I found this music venue called Hanoi Rock City, kind of like Detroit Rock City, mm-hmm. um, playing off that name. Um, I can't remember. Maybe Ryan can <laughs> tell me where that is. Is that a Kiss reference? Um, but I I believe it might be yeah yeah like maybe one of their albums or one of their songs i think it's one of their songs detroit rock city but yeah that that scene was like a in, in independent artist scene and um to live in a country where culture where the language is different the culture is totally different and it's like you feel like an outsider to find a a music scene that brought people from all over like 60 different countries were represented in this one place that felt like home so i spent a lot of time there and i met a lot of my friends there that's great. I always think that travel is a, a great asset to creativity in no small part because it gets you out of your normal environment. But, you know, it also just it, seeing things through that different lens, I think, opens something up inside your head that wasn't open before by default, probably. Yeah, something that really caught, came was very present when I was living in Vietnam. It was five years and it never really went away was I'm different. And there's nothing I can do to change that. Whereas like most part of society, you're kind of spending a lot of time trying to conform or fit in. Mm-hmm. And like, no matter how hard you try, you look different, you dress different, you talk different. Um, you care about very different things and you have no connection to the holidays or the, the, the things that are normal there, the normal trends. And you can try to like adapt to some degree, but they will always see you as sort of an other. Right. And when, when you are an other and there's nothing you can do about it, it's like, well, I'm going to lean into that because there's nothing I can do. I might as well be the most extreme version of Scott possible. And, and then it's like, it's almost like a, you kind of become your, I don't know, this powerful version of yourself. Or that's how I reacted to it anyways. 
That's really interesting, you know, because most of us don't have that opportunity to become the most extreme versions of ourselves <laughs> and might not even recognize those opportunities if, if we did for a while. So that, I think that's really, really cool. There is that, that whole, nobody knows me here. I can be whoever I want to be because nobody's expecting anything from me. You know, yeah. they're not expecting me to be a certain way or to do a certain thing or, you know, whatever. And that's, that's really freeing. Mm -hmm. It's something that I've recommended to a lot of people because I have a podcast as well, the Witness Underground podcast, and I have a lot of guests on and there, or I and I've also have guests on a lot of those kinds of shows um, about music or leaving a faith group and that our film talks about. Um, but they always, they often ask like, what advice could you give to someone who's going through that right now? And often my advice is change your physical environment. And that it's, it's not easy for everyone to do that. It's, it's actually a really difficult decision, even for me as a single, like 20 something, like go to another city. I don't know how to do that. That's like, sounds impossible. I have no network anywhere. How do you do it? Reality is like, once I've done it, it's like, oh, there are jobs everywhere. There are apartments everywhere. There's grocery stores everywhere on the planet. You can actually do it anywhere. It just sounds daunting if you've never done it. And, and you don't have to go to another continent or the other side of the planet. You can actually go to the next county over to the other small town, if that's where you happen to be. And it would have the same kind of effect in that no one expects anything of you. So you can do and be who you are. You can reinvent yourself or be the person you yeah. want to be. Yeah. It's, it's something that I think we don't think is, is possible. So we don't even register the idea unless somebody puts it into our heads. You know, or yeah. we just happen to land in that right set of circumstances where it's like, oh, hey, wait, I can do something different. I can be somebody different, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it's a it's a powerful thing. So, Ryan, how about you? Were you a creative kid from the beginning or did you discover your creative side later on? No, I was definitely a creative kid from the beginning. I uh, I started. um I think the first three loves I had creatively were drawing, uh, writing, and uh, inventing. I, I couldn't decide if I wanted to be H.G. Wells, Thomas Edison, or um, Vincent Van Gogh, right? It was like <clears throat> all, of, all of the above. Um, my brother, uh, Rhett, was uh, a little bit of more than a year older than me, and he was a brilliant musician. He was obsessed with music from really young, and my uh, mom was a singer in a band, and so <clears throat> music was always there, and I sort of took music for granted, like, oh, well, that would be the easy default one, so I got to go do one of the other ones. Mm, you know, Rhett's, yeah. the, Rhett's the music guy. So um, I actually avoided trying to learn anything about music. I loved music and I had all my favorite records and, but I tried to learn anything uh, as much as, as little as I could about actually becoming creative with music um, because I was going to, I was going to do the other things. And really my, you know, I decided I'm a writer. I'm going to be a writer. That's my thing. That's my jam. That's what I'm going to be when I grow up. Um, but I never really settled in and I still haven't. I mean, I'm, I'm still a person who is interested in almost all forms of creativity. Um, I still see it as the same thing when I, I've, I've like written software and games because I've been working as a software developer for a long time. Um, I think that's creative. I've done paintings. That's creative. I've recorded lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of music um, <laughs> and shot films and, and done uh, photography and all the same things. And so Scott and I are really similar from that perspective. We're both um, sort of across the board, but I did find that, as much as I love all those other forms of creativity, um, probably music was where I probably should have started because it's the natural one for uh, how I was born. It's just mm -hmm. a, I have a music brain and um, I'm just, that's who I'm always going to be. So yeah, always was that creative kid. And like Scott, we did have a place to play and do all this. Um, and long suffering parents. Um, when my, uh, brother and I, uh, I was probably six or seven when we decided to form our first band and we were triggered by the idea that I had with my invention side to make a drum set by using ice cream pails and cardboard and tape. Oh, and so wow. we took like the ice cream, one gallon ice cream pail and wrapped cardboard around it and then used duct tape and made little tom-toms. And then we were like, well, we need a snare drum. So then we took like this metal 
like Brady Bunch lunchbox and we put crayons in it and we found that if you hit it, it sounded kind of like a snare because the crayons would vibrate in there. And then like, so we built this whole kit and my brother started drumming on it and he was so good so fast that my parents went out and bought him a kit, that like a real drum set. Wow. Like, and it was, uh, it was pretty cool. Um, and then, and then that was when I was like, okay, so now that's yours, Rhett. You, you, you could do that. Um, but, you know, we had the drum set in the room and then we just had sort of instruments accumulating. Eventually we christened it Nuclear Gopher and I'm literally sitting in its descendant right now, surrounded by <laughs> instruments and even the sign from our first concert from 40 years ago. So it, uh, it was just an unbroken chain all the way back to early childhood. So I guess I don't have to ask if your parents were supportive if they went out and bought a drum kit that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> no, they... They actually tried to get him on Star Search. They were just like, oh my God, we got a prodigy. Wow, that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, Ed McMahon. Yeah. yeah. Rhett tried out. Wow. wow. That so must cool. have been an interesting adventure. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty neat. I was a little jealous, not going to lie. Did you get to go along? <laughs> no. No, I was there when they took this, his little like pictures in the living room for his audition. And then, and then I found out that they decided not to put him on. So oh. that was as much as I got to see. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so I know that, that your story with music is a little bit different than most people's because I watched the documentary. But um, thank you, you for kind that. By of, the way. Oh, you're welcome. Can, can you kind of give us a little synopsis of how that was complicated? Yeah. Um, I think the the thing that really motivated the way it wound up was that we thought the world was going to end. Um, our religious uh, beliefs basically said that we lived in the last days that started in 1914 and that people alive in 1914 would still be alive when Armageddon came and the end of the world came. So it's the 1980s, right? And we're making music for fun. But we're also thinking like, man, those 1914 people, they're like getting old and the world could literally end next Wednesday. So you don't, when you think the end of the world is coming any minute now, you're kind of not thinking, oh, I want to invest more in this. I want to go become a rock star or, you know, go to Juilliard and pursue something. You're thinking, <clears throat> how do I make my, make it so I can keep doing this fun thing without you know, anybody trying to stop me. <laughs> and so our music um, world, we understood the kind of rules in the JW world, which, you know, we couldn't have swearing in the songs. We couldn't write songs that were like sexy or worldly or talked about drugs. Um, but even more than that, like we also knew not to write overtly religious songs because um, that was the, the Watchtower Society did those songs. And so we sort of just intuitively knew what what would be allowed and what wouldn't and um and it sort of gave us um we had the, that space then where we could just express ourselves and discover our creativity i mean i was like 15 when i first read natalie goldberg's book writing down the bones and started using buddhist writing practice and and like to to write my songs you know so like it sort of opened this little back door to um emotional release to being able to say things you couldn't say otherwise by encoding them in song lyrics or just even, you know, connecting with people on a different level other than the spiritual um, or it's, a, it's somebody you go to school with who you're not really allowed to be super friends with. So music really came into this really important role um, for, for me and my brother. And then eventually my younger two siblings as well. We all just needed it. Um, in order to sort of maintain a balance of sanity and in order to um, process like deeper emotional things or whatever that like there's no outlet for in the Jehovah's Witness culture. It's it's a, you know, five meetings a week and you're you're going door to door and you're very constricted and constrained. And if you have something you want to say, or you need to get off your chest. Being able to put it in a song was like salvation. You know, um, so that was that was uh, I still think that that's, you know, it's why I'm here today. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's interesting to me because honestly, you know, until 
I heard from you guys and and watched the documentary, I had not ever thought of, well, I first of all, I had not ever thought about Jehovah's Witnesses a whole heck of a lot because I'd never ca- encountered too many. But I certainly never thought that it was a cult because I didn't know that much about it. So I was really surprised. And yet, when you're talking about you know, that kind of situation where you're supposed to be there five times a week and you have all of these rules and you're kind of separated from everybody else. It's yeah, it's, it definitely fits, fits the description as they say. And so it it just intrigues me that I got the impression that music in general was kind of frowned upon and yet you guys got away with it somehow. Well, what I like to remind people of sometimes is that you know of some Jehovah's Witness musicians and some other famous Jehovah's Witnesses. You may just not think of it that way because Prince was a Jehovah's Witness. And I think most of us know Prince. Um, he became a Jehovah's Witness because he studied with Larry Graham, who was the bass player from Sly and the Family Stone and one of the guys who invented the funk bass back in the 70s. And he has a band called Graham Central Station still. He's an elder in a congregation in the Twin Cities. Um, Venus and Serena Williams are Jehovah's Witnesses. Like they, they, it, it does happen. But like you say, like most people don't really recognize or think about the witnesses as much, other than like an annoyance on a Saturday morning or those goofy people with the carts. And right, that's really because it is so closed. You mm-hmm. know, we we the 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 word cult, which we don't use much in the documentary, but we do use, and it is accurate. Um, is enough of a loaded word that I tend to to try to let people understand what's going on before I say it. Mm-hmm. But the Watchtower Society is very much a very, like, us and them. There's the rest of the world. Then there's the society. And if you're in, you don't realize how separate you are from everybody else. Even, like, just the the walls you wind up with between you and even your friends, if they're not witnesses. And so, yeah, it's very, very closed. And and the few bubbles of uh, accidental successful Jehovah's Witnesses are probably just statistically, you know, unavoidable. Like every once in a while, somebody who happens to be a Jehovah's Witness is going to get famous. Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five were all Jehovah's Witnesses or raised that way. Um, so it, it happens, uh, but it's rare. It's not encouraged. Um, and frankly, even if you look at the nuclear gopher story, how the heck were we going to ever have broken out of that bubble with the way we felt like we had, well, I felt like I had to do it. I mean, I was kind of running it. Um, it helped our, our little scene, the way it was structured being online and being sort of underground a little bit helped us all connect with each other. And it Mm -hmm. helped like this community grow over Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, St. Louis. Like we had all sorts of fun. It was great. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But it wasn't, um, it was just, uh, uh, you know, nobody was going to probably break into any mainstream or become rich and famous that way unless they just lucked into it because we weren't trying. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, Prince does ring a vague bell with me now, but I did not know about the Jacksons or the Williams sisters. So. They don't trumpet it. Uh, Who else? Yeah. George Benson. You're a big... (laughs) 1970s jazz guitarist. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Then there's a lot more who are who left the religion who went on to become famous, but they don't usually talk about the fact that they came from that faith. There's, if you look up like former Jehovah's Witness artists or musicians, it's like you have like 60 people that you have, some of them for sure you'll heard, you'll have heard of. Wow. Which is what our my podcast is like. You saw the film. Mm-hmm. It's about it like a, a nuclear gopher is like an insular group in a finite location but there's people like this all over the world like all over the planet because religions all over the planet so people have left that religion all over the planet who have then used music and art to process their trauma and like have their voice and say what they wanted to say and they have a lot of emotions and they put it into this art form it's beautiful so like that's the podcast which has been super fun because it's like it's not just this one thing it's it's not just this nostalgic piece from the past where people that left the you know they made music in the religion they left and made more music that's even you know more powerful and then but you know that's like one thing. It's like no, it's a present day global thing that's happening, which is super exciting, and I love working on it. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Sounds very cool. So, 
there are so many things to ask here. Um, I I thought it was really fascinating too that it was like your your connections through the music that kind of led you to say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, think of music in this sense almost like power lines, right? Like I I didn't uh, wake up one day and start having my belief system crumble because I was doing music, but I had all these connections with people. Um, you know, James in the film, Chad in the film, uh, Eric and Cindy, these are some of my closest best friends and people I thought of as my literally thought of as my brothers and sisters. And we were all sharing with each other, including what we wrote online on our blogs or our live journals or whatever. Cause it was, you know, a, a while back. Um, and so that connection that we forged by being creative together, when I broke all the cardinal rules and started spouting, you know, non-belief uh, and asking things online and writing things the connection we already had from the creativity thing stuck around and they actually like they secretly read what i was writing and then um and then they did their own research and then we reconnected and we got creative again so it was almost like it was just the the fact that we had those other connections almost transcended the religion i guess and mm. i didn't know scott at the time but scott was close with eric Eric, uh, Scott sort of was like a, 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 a second order removed from, from stuff that I was writing that I didn't know anybody was reading. And I'm in no way taking credit for other people changing their views directly, I think. But I think they saw that at least somebody they loved and somebody they were connected to creatively was willing to say things and willing to write things. And then it got them thinking they did their own, they did their own work you know, um, and, and that led to, uh, or helped lead to Scott, uh, making his, his decisions and doing what he did. And then years later, he came out of the woodwork and contacted me and that led to the movie. So, um, I really do think without the music, I don't think any of this would have happened because I would have just left. Right. And mm -hmm. been the outside apostate shunny guy, and nobody would have paid any attention to me for the rest of my life. And I'd probably be standing on a street corner screaming right now, you know? So. Scott, you want to add to that? I misrepresent anything? No, that's perfect. I mean, you could represent even deeper. I feel like your what you wrote in your blog turned like changed Eric's mind. He did, like you said, he did his own work. And then I was communicating with Eric as I was sort of leaving the religion, and we were trading books like um, Dawkins. Um, what's that main book he did? Uh, eight, uh, God Mind Delusion. Watchmaker. God delusion is the one God I delusion. But we were like trading as witnesses, active witnesses. We were trading books by atheists. We were trading books by um, biologists. And we were like, have you, have you read this theory? What about this theory? And then, then we challenge each other. Well, like, yeah, I mean, sure. That's an interesting point. Um, for example, I was reading a book about Michael B. He, I don't want to give him any, he wrote about uh, intelligent design <laughs> and, and then Eric's like, yeah, cool book. Um, that totally corroborates your version of reality that we all learned in the religion. But have you read this blog that breaks it all down and, and shows the counter arguments that that book is like, he's making a Christian point about creationism. Like you have to read what other people say that disprove it because he's just trying to, I don't know, for example. So we were like having these kinds of dialogue and we were reading these books and, um, and I, Eric gave me critical thinking it was like a gift. And that probably came directly from Ryan doing critical thinking in public on his blog that people were secretly reading. And eventually I left the religion, not just for that one reason, that was a big part of it. But um, like the Ryan's, Ryan's writing had this huge ripple effect in that community and then in beyond the greater community. And the reason we were all connected, like you said, is music. Um, and then it wasn't, yeah, it was like eight years later, I had this like burning desire to like, well, I don't talk to my family anymore and that's a problem and shunning. What does that mean about this religion? Like, I just uh, disagree with their belief system in many, many reasons and why, uh, for many reasons, but this, this, this idea that like we talked about the, the word cult, I mean, they're, they're, a, they have a lot of negative traits and you can't leave it, uh, in dignity and people will 
put 20 different negative labels on you and shout that from the rooftops that you're one of these kinds of people. And we will never talk to you again because of those things. And they're not even necessarily true. Like I left for completely logical belief system reasons. Like I, I deconstructed myself through 10 years of being in the religion. And once I was finally out, anyway, there's a lot I could say, but um, yeah, Ryan's writing really connected that. And the music had this through line that kept us all together. And eventually I want to tell a story. And I was like, I, I heard about this guy, Ryan, and I know he was important in the music scene that I was a part of and kind of influenced by and in Minneapolis, because I lived there when I went to school, when I went to college for photography. And I was like, do you guys know that guy? Like, who was that guy? <laughs> Wasn't he like related to this other musician we were friends with? Can you guys put me in touch with him? And then we were got in touch for the first time and Ryan came out and we did an interview and it was awesome. It was, it became, I was like, that's the, one of the most powerful interviews I've ever done. And that's a way bigger story than I'm used to gap capturing as a, as a podcaster. And I was doing like a, I call it XW coming out. It was like deep dive interview series about your exiting story from this faith group. Mm-hmm. It was my first idea. And Ryan's story was like, whoa, we can make a film with that. And I had not really thought about making a movie um, at that point. But after an interview, I thought a lot about it. Anyway, that's like the longer version of the story. <laughs> You're regretting that now, aren't you, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I really thought I could do it in like six months. Uh, here we are five and a half years later. <laughs> we, wow. we did finish it. We shot it and finished editing in three full years. A little less than three years. But then there's a whole other part of making a movie is how do you get the movie in front of people? The distribution of the movie. So that's where we're at right now. Right. But, um, well, before we jump into yeah. that, I'm, I'm just yeah. fascinated because right. earlier today I was thinking about how, you know, every repressive regime always goes after the artists first. And mm-hmm. and I thought, wow. you know, yeah, because being an artist is expressive and does involve critical thinking and thinking outside of the box and all of that. But But I'd never thought before right now about how it's not, it's not the art itself alone that's subversive it's all of those artistic connections because i think if you had been doing art in a vacuum you might not have had a set of connections that were willing to listen to you and you know have your back and that you felt safe with and it would have been a very different story that's 100 percent true yeah and and the the fact that being creative if you're really going to create if your if your art's going to be honest, which it has to be for it to help you, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be able to say anything, and so you have to learn the ability to question yourself and question your beliefs, even if you're just saying like, I remember there was a song I wrote in like I don't know 1990. I was a kid, and but in this song, I actually tried to say how I had been experiencing some doubts and questionings about my faith, and I and about that you know, Satan was messing with me and trying to get me to think twice about things or whatever. And it was like, I had to wrestle to write that. And then, but then I did. And then I wrote it and I wrote music to it and I recorded it with my brother and some other people. And we used to play it on stage. I played it at witness graduation parties and nobody knew what I was singing about, but I did. And, and it was like even learning the ability to give yourself those little windows to like think about second guessing or think about revalidating is a skill you get by being doing creative work if you're honest about it. Even if you're just writing something, you know, that you don't ever share with anybody and you rip it up, even telling yourself it's okay to do it can feel liberating. And so I definitely know that I got that from that. And I mean, I do think that you, you can't overestimate how it helps your brain to learn lateral thinking and creative thinking. Um, and and I think most people who are creative are ultimately going to find their way out of a high control organization. I mean, it, not all of them. Some of them will find a way to keep themselves in the box, especially if they think they're mm. going to die if they get out. Um, but yeah, it, you're totally right. They go after artists, artists first for a reason. Yeah, well, and what's striking me about what you just said is that you played this song all over the place and nobody caught on. I mean, that that is, you know, clearly either they weren't just weren't paying attention and looked at it as background music mm-hmm. or there was a complete lack of ability or interest in saying, hey, wait a minute. 
that was interesting what he just said. I don't I don't think you're supposed to say that. You know, because I was going to say, did your parents catch on? Because I know that, you know, it didn't seem like they had any clue in the movie. No, but no. But the, the, it, on the other hand, I mean, if I told you, like, so the opening line of the song is, somebody handed me a check and a brass watch with a chain, and I stood looking at them, sipping Molotov cocktails in the rain. And I was talking about being handed the reward after a lifetime of faithfulness and looking at it thinking I feel terrible and I just want to burn it all down and like but it's metaphorical enough and obscure enough right that I can sing that in front of a hundred people and none of them know that I'm basically saying I'd almost rather like destroy my life even with even if I could live forever, I'd almost rather destroy my life than than not be able to do what I need to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I learned I don't know, I got good at metaphor. <laughs> that does it certainly complicate whether or not people pick up on stuff for sure. Well, you have to. You got to encode it. It's yeah. Yeah, I don't have to do that anymore. So how long was it between writing that song and when you left? Fourteen years. Wow. Whoa. Okay. Actually, can you tell what the names of your albums were? I think that's really, really interesting um, that you did with the Lavone. Oh, the well, yeah. Some of them had some interesting titles in retrospect. Um, my brother and I's albums. The first one was called Psycho Trauma. Uh, then How old uh, were you when you titled it that? Twelve. Uh, Oof. <laughs> We had one called We Don't Exist. Um, another one was called Psychotic Requiem. Uh, uh, then we had A Spectacle for Compassionate Minds. Um, a Concert for No One. Um, yeah, a lot, of our, <laughs> a lot of our album titles were, I guess, telling in retrospect. Yeah. 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 And 14 years is a pretty long time to wrestle with something like that. Yeah. Well, I got I got married really young out of high school and became a dad when I was like 20. And um, I really kind of focused my life on, uh, you know, keep your head down, do the right thing. Armageddon's coming tomorrow anyhow, so don't question it too much. Raise your kid, uh, be a good dad. Um, you know, and that's when I started a career in doing computer programming which led me to almost immediately put all the music online and created this whole community <laughs> which is awesome um but yeah it was uh i think you know in an alternate universe i think i probably as a teenager i would have known that this wasn't who i was and wasn't what i believed but i had lots of incentive to stick with it not the least of which was that i loved my brother and I was so close to my brother and we did all of our music together. I wasn't going to do anything. I was going to take that music. Right. Away. Right. And I mean, honestly, from from the titles you just listed, it sounds like you did know on a certain level. And it was more a matter of what am I going to do with that? I'm not going to do anything with it right now. Yeah. You know. Yep. I was pretty clearly divided. And I knew that there was like how I really felt. And there was what I had been convinced to believe and every positive in my life was tied to the second one and how I really felt was not as relevant. So again, creativity, like, like Cindy says in the movie, you know, like music was her savior. We're all Mm -hmm. connected by that. All of us in this, in the, in this community. Sure. Well, and, and honestly, cognitive dissonance is a powerful drug. Yep. Could you actually describe how you, see cognitive dissonance or how you understand it, Nancy? Cognitive dissonance, as I understand it, is the chaos caused in your mind by two completely contradictory pieces of information and how you try to navigate. And most people end up deciding that they're going to stick with one and ignore the other one for as long as they possibly can because they can't handle that chaos. That's that's my understanding, roughly speaking. That was beautiful. <laughs> I know, yes. like a lot of people don't know what that is. And I just recently, a few years ago, learned the term existed. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a great way to describe what was happening for most of my life. Yeah, that, I think most I, of us, the first time we hear it, are like, oh, wait, I know exactly what you mean. I didn't know there was a word for it, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. 
I was trying to square so many of their beliefs growing up that like everything I was learning contradicted so many of their beliefs. And you can only do that for so long before it, like you have to deal with it. You have to choose one source of information over the other one and things pile up over time. Like, well, you know, 1 million things I've read say this thing is true. And there's a lot of people backing it up with like real evidence. Um, I can't really accept the other one. It feels like fairy tale at this point. That kind of thing started happening. Yeah. But when the consequence of saying, I don't accept that one anymore is your whole world falls apart. Yeah. It's, it's hard to get up and do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, something you said about, if you don't mind, um, no, go North ahead. Korea. I tell people a lot. They're like, what was, what was it like? Like this weird religion you grew up in? Like, oh, it's kind of like North Korea, which is extreme. And I don't want to like take away from the extremity of like a North Korean experience. I don't really know what that is. But they did something that I learned about recently. Um, They started going over the border into South Korea and kidnapping really famous film actors and directors to make their own movies. But they kept them in solitary confinement until they broke them psychologically, until they agreed Uh. to do their craft in North Korea for the goals of the government. And so now there's, and they're still there. Like they're still living there, making movies for the government. And they made like, cause the government tried to make a bunch of movies and they like the brother of the, the leader, I think it was Kim Jong uh, Il mm-hmm. or the one before him. Uh, I can't remember now the exact history. I think and the Kim Jong Il was the father and Kim Jong Un is the current one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was Kim Jong Il um, got like his brother or son to like manage media and propaganda and they were making movies every year and it was no one liked them. They were terrible, especially on the global scene. So then they made a movie using these like famous artists and directors and actors from South Korea that had kidnapped. Um, and then they became, they started making really good content and they started getting recognized for making good content. But it was like from this terrible experience. Um, and another one that comes to mind is V for Vendetta, which is not a real story, but it's the, the movie uh, it takes place in England as a fiction. And there's a great graphic novel that goes with it. Like there's people who are collecting art in secret places. And if you got found with art, you would get put into prison or taken out or killed or whatever. Um, so like the main character has like this amazing underground art collection and like your idea of like the authoritarian regimes go after the artists first. Mm-hmm. They kind of, they have to, to like control people or control ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know that they were doing that with folks from South Korea, which is utterly horrifying. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's awful. It's a great documentary about it. I don't remember what it's called, but I was blown away. Like, that's so extreme. Like, they were trapped for like eight years before they agreed to do it. Like, you have to do it. Like, I won't do it. I refuse to act. And then eventually, like, okay, I can't be alone all this time. Right. Oi. Wow. Well, let's, let's move from that (laughs) into how how this this documentary i mean you sort of have have alluded to it already but how how did you guys decide this was the thing to to make and i mean you mentioned it took what three years so i mean obviously a bigger project than you originally thought how did it all come together i want to tell a story about shunning and I didn't know how to do that. And that's how I started doing the XGW coming out interview series, which is just one person. The idea was to like have the sit down interview, nice lights, a couple cameras and do it properly, professionally. And then I would go shoot with them and doing whatever the thing that they love, their modern day thing. That's their thing. Even if it's just like, oh, they're, this is their job or this is their like daily commute, uh, riding trains across Germany or um, riding motorcycles to go to work or to their, do their fun thing in Vietnam where I was living. Um, so I started doing those things. And it was really fun. And I crowdfunded to keep that project going because I loved it so much, but it wasn't really getting the traction I thought it would, wasn't getting the attention I thought it would. So I was like, well, let's, let's make it a bigger thing. And during that time period, I, I met Ryan and we did our interview. And then I was like, well, the very first interviews I want to do are with people that I love and the music connection. So I went to Minneapolis because I was like, I know these people and I know, and they've been giving their music. They'd already been working with me with their music as a soundtrack to that project. Um, but I, the, the burning desire to make a show about shunning is because it's a universal experience, not just for people who leave this particular religion, but also Amish, also ex-Orthodox Jewish, also um, uh, evangelical. There's like a more conservative side of the evangelicals. And, there, and it goes on and on and on. There's groups in India and there's groups all over the world that have been repeat this experience. It's a just one of the, you can't live in a dignified way. This experience happens and people get rid of you. They cut you off emotionally, um, actually, 
and well, there's a parallel space. with your choice to use the term coming out too, because there's yeah. also people in the in the LGBT community who they you know, they get cut off by their families for the rest of their mm-hmm. lives just for stepping out and being who they are. And again, no graceful or dignified way amongst certain things where you have to either choose to be or not to be. And that's it. Right. And then you're going to lose those people. So I, I just, I'm not meaning to jump in on you there, Scott, but I just, I think it's important. I, I, I resonated with that when I first saw that you called it, you know, it, it coming out, I thought, you know, it is a non it is specific to the witnesses in the context of the people you're working with but it's not specific to the witnesses in the context of the experience of like social ostracism or people having to um admit or be uh honest about who they are what they are what they feel what they believe and then getting the social repercussions of loss of relationships only the sith Think in absolutes. <laughs> if, I can, if I can quote Star Wars, <laughs> you totally can. <laughs> um, yeah, it's black and white thinking, and I appreciate you bringing that up. That was um, the very first interview I did. It was um, a good friend of my brother's ex-wife who left the religion, and her and I are still very close. Um, she knew this other friend from Chicago who also settled in Germany after leaving the religion. But he 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 said in our very first interview, he's like, "I came out twice. I came out gay at nineteen, and I left the religion." So I get to, I'm the only gay person I know in the world who came out twice, something like that. He says in the interview and I was like, wow, that's a really, I want to use, can I use that for the title of the project? And we just went with it and we stuck with it. I still have that project going. It's a YouTube series. It's like all the other interviews that didn't make the movie. And mm-hmm. there's like 30 interviews and we put out like 18 of them. So I have a civil backlog of interviews I want to go and cut, but this film took the precedent because I was like, Ooh, this is, this is the thing. This is the rich story of shunning and it's it's so parallel to my story it's almost i like to say it's um autobiographical and that ryan's reason for leaving that we really explore in the middle of the second chapter of the movie the kind of the his real his coming coming out realization story um that he tells and all the losses that come from that the innocence uh family friends community um relationships of all kinds um all those losses are, and then, and then how people treat him after mm-hmm. cutting him off. That's the story I really wanted to tell all these years. And I was like, wow, that's like, that is the thing I've been looking for. And to be able to do that with music was like, okay, now my worlds are all coming together. <laughs> and, and, and also he had, he and James Zimmerman, the author in the film who wrote deliverance at hand, redemption of a devout Jehovah's witness. James had been the filmmaker for a lot of the music videos and short films and trailers and um, Ryan's like, you got to meet this guy. He shot that music video that we did about cannibalism. She cooked me up and ate me for dinner. It was like a, a goofy, funny thing that they did. I was like, okay, cool. And he had like a backlog. Him and his wife um, had like this backlog of, of videos that they had done with Ryan and that whole community going back like over, over a decade worth of content. Um, that was like a backlog that made it a documentary. I can do interviews all day shooting modern day footage. And that kind of is like a doc. It's almost more like news, mm-hmm. news style. And, um, so I was like, wow, I have this to, I could make it into a proper documentary with all that backlog of film that they had done plus all the backlog of music and tell the story emotionally. Cause that's like my background is like, how do you carry story with music? And I really wanted to explore that and they were down for it. And they'd already been involved, Eric and Cindy, especially with high TV, they'd been doing the soundtrack of that whole project. So to have all those pieces kind of. I was like, wow, this, this is kind of becoming a thing. For me, it was all very foggy. I didn't really know. I went and shot like eight more interviews after shooting with these guys in Minneapolis that same couple of months after we crowdfunded. And I, for, it took me a while to like really sit. I'm like, yeah, that, that was amazing what we did. Like that, that is the movie. I, there's, a whole, there's a whole story in this. So then I got a, a story editor together and we worked together and cut the whole thing down from like 15 hours of content down to two. And we spent like a year getting rid of 30 more minutes and moving things around to like really capture the story and, it's, it's a whole process and there's a lot of learning curve there. And I've worked with a few professionals and did a lot of um, learning while doing. Um, it's my first big feature documentary, um, but it wasn't exactly the plan. And I'm so happy, <laughs> but it was a plan in my life to someday make a feature documentary and go through the film festivals. And we did that. And it was super fun. And we went to 11 festivals and we won an award at one, but we, the one we won an award at was a horror film festival. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I think some people, part of me is like, I don't, it doesn't seem that crazy to me, this whole thing, because I lived it. 
like, it's a part of my life. It's a part of, it's not, can't be that crazy. But then like, people are like, oh my God, that's like, that's darker than the horror films that we make. <laughs> you know? It's yeah, real. I mean, I can see that though. You know, I mean, cause it is, it, it's, I can only speak for myself, but at least for me, it's, it's difficult to watch without being horrified, you know, by, by the whole reaction and, and just the fact that, I mean, we all know that there are groups like this that exist that isolate people from communities and whatever. And their goal is to keep you isolated because then if they don't, you'll leave and make, make them look bad and, and whatever. But still, I think most of us are familiar with it more as an abstract concept and don't ever have the opportunity to see a specific story and how it plays out. So, so yeah, in that respect, it is kind of, you know, I can, I can see where it could kind of land in horror territory in a way. So there's something we want to do that was to humanize the cult experience. Mm. Maybe as someone who just watched it, how did that land for you? I, I think that it works that way because you you see, I mean, you're essentially seeing it through Ryan's eyes, you know, with added facets from the others. But but you have that perspective of this is what my life was like. This is what I knew. And because this is what I knew, this is what I did and didn't do and how I struggled with the whole thing. And, you know, the fact that if you say I'm out of here, you're never going to see most of your friends and your family again is a massive, massive consequence that, you know, I don't know how you watch something like that and don't put yourself in that place, even though you can't obviously, you know, understand the full experience because it didn't happen to you. You're still, you're still relating to the person who's telling it and just imagining, my God, what if that would, ha you know, what if I did something like that? You know, what if I was in that kind of situation? So I think, I think it definitely brings it to that, that level where anybody who's watching it is going to say, Oh, wow. You know, this is, this is something I'm glad I don't have to experience, but I feel awful for people who do, you know, and, and I'm curious, Ryan, to know, you know, what, what did you think of the idea of basically taking your story and turning it into something for the whole, the whole world potentially to see? So sometimes I've, I've got this uh, joke that I do at work where I will walk into my boss during a one-on-one -on -one or something and I'll be like, so am I fired? And, and, and it's kind of just think of the worst thing that can happen and then think, what if he said yes, right? Okay, would I live? Um, and when I, <clears throat> once I had to tell my father that I didn't believe anymore, that was the worst thing I could do, right? Mm -hmm. It was the sort of like the, the committing suicide step of leaving. And um, so subsequent stuff, I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to lean into being uh, proud of and confident about who I am, what I believe, what happened to me. I'm not going to be apologetic about it. I'm not going to give the power away to them. Um, and so as Scott can attest, when he first reached out to me about this, I responded with like this 13 page biography that I just wrote him back. I literally wrote this Google doc. With, I think it was 13 pages. And I was like, you think, you know, something about the story. This is what happened, you know? And, um, and, uh, and I was just, I think I wanted this to be told mm -hmm. because A, they couldn't, I mean, how do you shun me more? You're already never talking to me. So, yeah. you know, we're already there. Um, uh, but there's still the, the, I have, I still see my family members on the rare occasions when somebody dies or, you know, like most recently it was my grandmother's funeral. Um, uh, but, th and they will act normal around me. Like, like they, they have to, because they're putting it on for other people. But when I realized that I I had already paid the price, then it's like, well, what's the potential, um, upside to doing this. Mm -hmm. And the upside is somebody else will go through this and they'll go, yeah, but I saw that documentary 
And I know that I can get better on the other side of it. And it was so I told Scott right up front, I was like, it's important to me that this is not just some sort of anti Jehovah's Witness propaganda piece. That's not my goal. Mm -hmm. Um, It is important to me that this helps people understand this experience in a way that if they are facing it, they feel less, less alone. And if they know somebody who's facing it, they can think about how to help. And if they are, uh, are completely unaware of it from the Jehovah's Witness perspective, but they have other um, reasons why this resonates for other reasons uh, in their lives that they can benefit because at least then it's, it's worth a damn, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, this happened for, for some sort of net benefit. So I was pretty clear with Scott, like how the tone of the movie would, um, would be acceptable to me. And my sort of, um, I guess yardstick I still keep in my head is, and I don't know if this will ever happen, but if if my family members watched this movie, which to my knowledge they never have, and I don't think they ever would, but if they did, would I be okay with that? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. They would understand better the impact their actions had on me in my life. Um, and so I think Scott handled things very well. Um, I have great love and respect for him because of this, because it was a very hard thing for me to, to, to decide to do. Um, and, um, I think that the end result, um, is something that is, I think it's going to do a lot of good in the world that this movie exists. And so that makes me feel like, you know, yeah, nothing's going to change about my experience about whether, you know, I got hurt the way I did or traumatized the way I did. And I have, for for your for your viewers or listeners, I, I have moved on with my life. I've got a very great life, and I'm happy. Um, they this movie was a while ago, um, but I think it's important. Um, it I did second guess it. I've had some occasional freakouts about it, um, but I wouldn't change it. I, I I would wouldn't have done it different. Uh, at the end of the day, and that a lot of a lot of that again just boils down to Scott. He could have he could have handled it a very different way. Um but he did a a really like it was clear that because he felt he was sort of telling his story by proxy with mine he was very sensitive to it and um and that worked out really well well and that was going to be my next question for scott was what is like telling somebody else's story when you have so much in common with it one is that it was amazing to be able to have something that's like this is basically my lived experience put a different face and, and voice to it um and so that was really special because so I have also a backlog of music and v- videos and I had this sort of, we, we have a very lot, a lot of very similar things. And then also to have the, the, his kind of logical deconstruction, have that be similar. And probably like we described earlier, like it was probably, mine was probably influenced by Ryan by proxy of these other people who are reading his blog is like a really special connection. Um, and I also just really respect them and their music. I think their music's amazing. And it's, that was another thing. It's like, this is this kind of undiscovered music collection of over 30 albums there's 32 albums in our campaign for kickstarter um and they'll they'll be available after that's over um and um i was just like this music has like been the soundtrack of my life now for years making the xw coming out project i want other people to have that experience it's awesome it's like powerful music in here um so all of that was very very special um and also there's something that like like and Ryan and I've talked about over the years is he couldn't tell the story and I couldn't really tell my own story, but to have the combination of the distance of having be able to tell someone else's story as like, I'm an objective viewer of their story in a sense mm-hmm. helped with the whole trauma side of it. And it also revealed a lot of traumatic things in my past. That I didn't hadn't dealt with properly up until the point of making the film. So I've since gotten therapy like I should have been doing <laughs> for a decade. And that's been really, really helpful. And um, it's a very triggering film. And it's hard to do. But yeah, very worth it. And I think there's also a special thing of like, I was trying so hard to tell this kind of story through all these interviews, being behind the camera. And I'm still in this film, of course, behind the camera. Um, yeah, I was going to say there. Oh, to have Ryan say like, yeah, you can tell this story. I think it's a great idea to tell the story, but here are 
the seven criteria that he just described or whatever mm-hmm. the number was. Like, <laughs> these are the criteria that I'm giving you if you want my involvement and I won't do the other thing. I won't, I won't get involved if it's going to be this other kind of thing that is really, really common. So if you, you dive into the former Jehovah's Witness world on the internet, there's like, I don't know, it's on re- it's like the ideas are on repeat, it feels like, and they're totally valid ideas, but they're not so deep or well thought through all the time. They're, I mean, they're just saying like, the religion's bad for this reason. This is what they said. It's contradictory. It's hypocritical. Oh my God, look at them. They're the bad guys. I'm hurt. And, and that's all totally true, but it's sort of like screaming out of anger at the world and like, mm-hmm. give, give us attention. Like this is, this needs to change. This sucks. And there's a lot more I could say about that to have deep respect for, but I wanted to change that narrative and having Ryan say like, I also want to change that narrative. And if you're going to involve me, it needs to be different. This is the story that really needs to be told. And it's way bigger and way more important. And it's about moving on. It's about healing. And it's about celebration of the good things as well. And so we made sure that it had all the elements Ryan was looking for. It also knows that he was very involved. So that's also rare about the documentaries to have. He basically became a film partner from the beginning. Like, this is how it needs to be done. And if you do that, you have this amazing archive of content, music, my involvement, my opinions. Um, I will help with this, you know, help. I will help make it happen. I'll help make the connections to make it happen. And so it was, he's, I mean, he's basically like, a co-producer, almost co-director in terms of like a documentary gets edited, it gets uh, directed in the edit more than it gets directed in the mm-hmm. shooting because you have like 10, 20 times more content to work with than you end up putting in the movie. And so um, we can talk about the credits later after this interview, Ryan. <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm such a diva. I'm always on you about me proving how I'm listening. <laughs> <in the credits. laughs> no, I, I wanted yeah. to say one thing um, uh, on what you were just saying, Scott. Um, just that um, there is, and, and I wouldn't expect that anybody, you know, who isn't a former Jehovah's Witness would be deeply involved in this world and, and neither should you. But there is a lot of um, anger that people hold on to after they leave because, and they have nowhere to put it, right? That's one of the advantages of shunning them is that they, you don't have to listen to them tell you how they feel about the thing. And you don't have to grant that their feelings have any validity. So people wind up bottling up that anger. And, and when I was a kid, I mean, they would literally pick at the conventions with my, my, we would be in there eating, uh, you know, ham sandwiches and drinking Shasta. And there would be people out front being like the Watchtower Society is evil. And that anger is a thing that when you're raised a witness and you see it, you, you are literally told that that is evidence that you're on the right side. Right. Like, look at the people who left. They're all screwed up. They're all bitter. They're all, you know, mentally diseased is the the phrase that they use. And um, and it was it's really important not to inhabit that 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 sort of um, space. And I, 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 everybody has to go through that space, but you have to get past it or else um, you just um, you are you're still basically a Jehovah's Witness at that point, like in your mind, you're living a Jehovah's Witness mindset and because everything is about being mad at them. And so I also went to therapy and you recorded a bunch of albums and I had like a target, which was get out of this headspace, move on with my life, raise my kid, be a human being, you know, um, no longer feel weird. Um, and that was why, again, it's I think it's good that that type of media exists. I think it's important that there's people out there holding the society to account and and saying those things but i also think it's important that people see something more of like yeah and also it gets better and also you can move on and um that was pretty important to me for scott to um that this that's what this had to be um uh just i think that's what it needs people need to see more of that you know the the, the first phase of just being angry can last for the rest of your life, but it's a lot healthier if it only lasts for uh, is the minimum amount of time it needs to. You burn yourself up. Yeah, that's an interesting point. It's the flip side of the same coin. And I don't think most people think of things like that that way. Well, it's a harder story to tell too, right? Like, how do you tell? Um, it's easier to kind of just harp on like, and I've there's a lot of it, it's like harp on like bad, 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 or, you know, there's 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 quite a bit of like, I guess, trauma porn out there with, mm. you know, people who went through something and then they cry and then that's kind of that. 
and it, it's a little more nuanced and a little more difficult to try to do what Scott did. Um, but again, that's like I said, I, that's why I appreciate it. I think it was a really creative act to make it work because it, it was kind of a tightrope. And I, and I, Scott gives me a little more credit than I deserve. I didn't really put my finger on like how to do this. The execution of how to make this a really good documentary was, was Scott's. I just told him the spirit I wanted it to be in. I don't think it would be as compelling a documentary if it was all everything is bad and I'm angry. You know, that's, that's not much of a story no. just for a start. You know, you could tell that story in about five minutes and be done. Yeah, yep. I agree. And yeah. there's a lot of that. And we want to make something different. And, and I think my, like Ryan's concept was very aligned and what he wanted was very aligned with the project I was already working on, which was, yeah. And then what happened? Like, yeah, mm. you got out and this is why you got out. Great. And then what did you do with a complete detachment from influence by family, friends, community, and, and this ability to go do anything you dream to do without any restrictions or people holding you back and people have gone and done amazing things. And that's what, like, I was so celebrating in the actually becoming out project. And I was so excited about, and maybe it doesn't resonate with the general public as much as I expected it to, because people are like, yeah. And then I started a carpentry business and I love it. And it's like, okay, so we're just like hanging out with a carpenter now or like, <laughs> you know, it's like not so exciting um, to the average person, but for, for them, it's like, I did it. I, I've always wanted to own my own business. And I went and did that thing. And then they're like totally enjoying their life. And, um, and so some, some of the stories sort of fall sort of like, oh, okay, cool. Great. Good for you. You know? And so maybe it doesn't like hit as hard, but this movie, it's sort of like demonstrating the rise over you know period of years using music as people like finding their voice and becoming like a rock goddess for, for Cindy Elvendahl's example yeah. in the movie, which I feel like she's so empowering and she's finding her voice and we can do that because we have so much amazing content. Um, whereas like the project was sort of like one person, you kind of get to know them there. There would be like 20 minute episodes and I don't know. I still love it. And I still think it's important. Um, and I want to, I'm going to keep going with it, but the film is way tighter, way more impressive and important and I, and there's, you know, to get really serious, people leave this or are stuck in the religion and then they, they off themselves and, and die. And, or then when they leave and they get cut off, they are traumatized and they're like, this is awful. I don't want to experience this anymore. And they also do like the suicide rate super, super high. And so we also want to demonstrate like, hey, these people aren't having like, they're not rock stars. They're not, they haven't had like amazing lives necessarily. Like we're not showing off like the, we're not showing off like the best example of a rock star or experience. We're showing people who like got out, went through some struggles and like use, use self-expression to kind of land on the outside. And it's a soft landing. And we demonstrate that you can do it too in a very human way. And I feel like that is a very relatable story. And, and we tried so hard to like convey that, you know, they're not, you, I mean, I'm not sure what your, what your experience was. But I don't know. Maybe you could give us a, an idea of what you thought of the end of the movie in terms of that. But you know, it's a very, I feel it's very human. Yeah. And, and I'm just thinking as you're talking, like part of what comes through is that there were what, five people that it focuses on, I think. Yeah. Like none of you, unless I completely misunderstood this, but I don't think any of you really did this fully on your own. I mean, you were all, you know, having little conversations and whatever, because you had the connection through the band and through the music. And so you know, I would imagine it's a whole lot harder if it's just Ryan on his own than it is when it's Ryan and everybody from his band. And so I don't I don't think that you're necessarily, you know, like really waving at that part. But I think somebody who's watching it is going to be like, you know, this would be a whole lot easier if I knew other people. You know, and maybe I don't right now, but I need to find some or I need to find some people who were not in this community ever that I can go hang out with so that I'm not totally on my own. I mean, I think that is a critical factor and and it would be for anybody in a similar situation. I think, you know, human beings are communal creatures. You know, mm -hmm. we don't do well in isolation because we're not supposed to. And that's part of why the shunning works. Right. You are cut off from your tribe boy, are you in trouble now because you have just lost your tribe and what are you going to do without them? And so it's a powerful threat. And the answer is find a new tribe. And it's amazing how strong uh, music is as a way to connect to people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, one of the first 
things that made me feel like I was starting to to connect with the world outside of my uh, Jehovah's Witness upbringing. Um, was and it took me two years to to do this, but it was playing in a band with some people who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses, who I didn't know from Nuclear Gopher, who were like, you know, just new people. But I, you know, if you've ever done a creative thing with somebody, if you've done a, if you've done acting, if you've, if you've done music, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever done a trust fall exercise where you just have to learn. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what it's kind of like, right? Like you, you, you've been told all these worldly people are evil and blah, 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 blah. blah. And then you're like, you know what? I'm going to get up and play some music with some of these guys and gals and others. And I'm going to trust them that it's going to be good. And then you feel connected again and you're like, wow. And that, and that's why I just, I, I think art is such a really important part of this. Like it, it's not the same without the communal art experience and, and, and it, it, I know there are other ways to make those connections, but I don't know them because I'm an artist. And so this is how I am. Um, but I, I think it's most people like there is that message right there. Um, you got to connect to other people. You got to use mm-hmm. something that you have as a way to connect to somebody else. And, um, you know, it, doing that through art and creativity is a very powerful way to do it. I'm sure other people could have other ways to, to do that. But I, I think being alone and isolated, I do know I have lost quite a few people. Um, I think I was sitting down figuring out like number one cause of people that I know who have died is, is suicide. Um, and it's uh, not something I like to dwell on very much, but I think it's because y- y- you can be so alone and, and art, is a wonderful way to deal with that, I guess is what it I'm is. trying to say. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So I want to make sure that we get to talk about the Kickstarter, and I'm curious to know how it is that you decided to do Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is one of many crowdfunding applications or uh, platforms. We actually crowdfunded this film, the making of the film, the production, the shooting of the film, in 2018 with Seed and Spark, which is a film-based crowdfund platform. And Kickstarter has is a very similar platform, but it also does products and other kinds of things. Um, people do music, like an, a single album or a single book. Um, but it's the, there's two pieces to crowdfunding, which is not just the money, it's also the crowd. And so now that we're releasing the movie and the film's ready to go, it's all ready to push, go in the distribution platform that we're working with to get it out in the world onto common streaming services. Um, there's a whole cost associated with that. And so um, we are raising finishing funds on Kickstarter while it takes like a crowdfund is is like a one or two years of communication condensed down into 30 days. And so it's like, okay, I have six hours today. I'm going to just write emails and write Facebook messages to people that I know and get the word out there. And getting the word out is the most important thing um, to to launch a film like we all know that Oppenheimer, the documentary, came out this this summer. Everyone's heard of it, whether they've seen it or not. And we want Witness Underground to be known. So thank you for having us on your channel. This is actually the crowd part of the crowdfunding right now, being on your on your show. And um, and it's it's another way. Yeah, they get, that's the main point. Marketing condensed, and then raise a bit of money to like actually push it out in the world and cover those finishing costs, finishing funds. It must be more challenging doing this on your own. Making a movie? Well, or to get it distributed. Uh, oh, it is. Yeah. Well, okay. It's a whole navig- whole thing to talk about. Um, we spent three years going from like concept, shoot, concept, crowdfund, shoot, edit the film and have a complete film that we can go to the film festivals with. And it's been a little over two and a half years trying to figure out how to ne- how to distribute it. And I've read some books on that rise of the film entrepreneur by Alex Ferrari, a huge fan of that. He's like, go full indie. It's the better way. Own your art, complete hundred percent ownership of the intellectual property. Um, if you get a distribution deal, make sure it fits these criteria and not, almost none of them do. And you have to fight and if you get a lawyer before you start the relationship um, to get like it to be just because they want like $30,000 up front or 10,000 plus 20% of the first, you know, and then, and then they take, 30% forever. And it's just like, oh my God, like they're just, and, and they might shelve it. They might not even put it out and they don't, they will never market it because they have a hundred other films or a thousand other films in their catalog. So it's like all these like pitfalls and like, are these a parasitic group? 
who's taking 10% this time, you know, like what's, and are they doing anything for that 10%? Will they actually do anything for the future? Um, so it, I've, I've been really navigating. I met a lot of indie filmmakers who have found a successful way to do this and um, they've been guiding our process. And the person who, and one of the people is actually on our team now that's helped. He's, he's the Kickstarter guy. So I'll give him a little props, Justin Giddings. Um, he, we, he helped us get into all the film festivals. And so we, he has a different project for that. And so this is like, hey, get let's work together. He's now on our team forever to the film release. And he's done like 300 plus films. And um, yeah, so it is a lot harder. But what I found is that even if you hire someone in the lower to mid tiers in the distribution world, it's not a, the higher ones won't necessarily get you because I don't know, there's a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole thing how the sausage is made. But <laughs> um, even if you get in a distribution plan with a company who will do supposedly do all the work to getting it out in the world for you, um, they're not necessarily a good partner and they might not ever do any marketing and they might, there's a n- number of ways for them to suck up all the profits from the film and, and just use you as their, um, use me as a, a filmmaker, us as a filmmaking group for their salaries rather than benef- mutually benefit from the film being seen, earning money for both of us. Right. And so what I've talked to all the people I've talked to, they're like, this is indie is a hundred percent better. It's more work. And, but then you'll have this other life skill. And you can do your second indie funded by the first one. So, you know, we're all excited about what are we going to do after this? Like, we want to go make the social impact we intended on with this movie, with Windows Underground. But we also want to make more art because we love it. And Mm -hmm. we've all learned all the skills to do it. And it's exciting to make the next thing. Um, So we're kind of like also finding our team. Like people come out of the woodwork like, oh, my God, this project's so cool. How can I get involved? A lot of authors have stepped up and crowdfunding is a lot of writing. So like that also kind of makes sense. Like. Musicians aren't exactly thrilled about writing people, but writers are super thrilled about writing people. So that's I'm talking about Scott. <laughs> well, you're a little of both, Ryan. You're like an author and a musician. So. Yeah. so I will put the link to the Kickstarter in the show notes, but can you just give everybody a sense of like what the timing is and what you're hoping for? Yeah. So right now we're at the beginning of November. We have until November 17th, 2023 to get our goal met, which is $20,000. We're at 59%. And the URL for that redirects, you can search for Witness Underground on Kickstarter, but it's witnessunderground.com. And that's our website. So that, that will have use, utility in your show for years to come. That website is where you'll find all the information about the film and the podcast, Witness Underground podcast. But right now it's yeah two week time frame to close the gap on, I think it's $8,000 left to hit our goal. Okay. And then yeah. when are you hoping to actually have it on different streaming sites? Well, it's going to be a bit of a piecemeal thing with self-distribution, indie distribution. So we actually got a deal, which is super exciting, that already took place. And it start, it's the process started. We sent them everything they asked for. We signed a contract to get it into libraries in Australia, New Zealand, and USA. Oh, so that will be an educational piece of it. And there's a few other pieces of the puzzle, like getting on Delta Airlines or Air Canada is like a, one of the documentaries and the you know four documentaries that they might have on a flight. That kind of thing is the avenue. Um, we're shooting for Tubi, which is an ad-based streaming service mm-hmm. that's really popular. It's, they have like 1% of the planet's market share on streaming, but they actually pay their filmmakers. So that's like target number one is get something that can sustain our yeah. our, our company. Because um, we ha- you have to build a company as well to like run to for every single film you make. So have like a separate LLC for Witten's Underground. Um, so we want to make it financially viable. Is like, can we do that? How do you do that? So we're like working that out. And eventually it'll end up on Amazon and Apple, which pay like, one penny per hour of viewing and that they're like the worst place to get. And they're very, I mean, for me, I think they're kind of parasitic. Yep. And I pay Amazon to watch films only. I don't even <laughs> buy stuff and I can't even find a film that's actually included in Amazon. So I don't even know what's going on there. Um, so, you know, we eventually want to get on the name household named streaming service that everyone's paying subscriptions for, but they're actually terrible deals for filmmaker. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's like 40, there's 40 kind of target. Uh, well, we're using film hub to give you full, understanding of what we're using and they have access to like 40 different streaming services um, and they're always expanding that and so two is on there two is top oh. of the list do we think november december will start to have availability right like not yeah. long after the kickstarter exactly yeah hoping in december um for the holidays hopefully people have be tired of hanging out with their family and they're going to want to watch an amazing movie oh, yeah it's sorry. a witness underground christmas yeah. everybody <laughs> <laughs> If what, you what, want to what, know where the term nuclear gopher came from. <laughs> <laughs> One of the um, interesting things about this campaign is we've been, this isn't like we just threw this together and it's like, you're just giving us money 
to help us because you believe in the project. You can, you're buying the film. You get to download um, November 17th. And there's a few things we need to make still, um, but we're in the process of cutting them, which is like all the full interviews in the movie, the uh, director commentary, um, the soundtrack is really, really special. And what's cool about that is like, I, as a filmmaker, I don't have access to their music. They gave me access on the contract for the film itself and for marketing the film. But as far as the music goes, like you're funding the artists themselves with the soundtrack and it's an amazing soundtrack. I'm super excited. We've been talking about that for years. Uh, we have 32 albums in the Kickstarter. So like you're buying the movie, you're going to get it. You're buying all the extra stuff that we're so we've been dreaming to make and make available. And it's now going to be available right now. Like as soon as the crowd, as soon as we hit our number, you're going to, and, and we charge you, uh, you're going to get all this stuff. And that's November 17th is when that happens. So you're actually pledging support. You're not getting charged until we are successful. And uh, a lot of all these artists, the 32 albums, the nine books that are available are all donated art to support the project and support the release of the film. And so you're getting something for your money. And it's everything we've ever dreamed to give for to relate it to this project. And it's something that will hopefully you'll appreciate and it'll change your life. And you can, ha- it'll be the soundtrack of your life and the books will impress you. And like, uh, I'm, I just, it's like such a beautiful coming together of all these artists in support of the release of this movie because they benefit, they, they value it. That's fantastic. Well, I hope that you get there and more between now and the 17th. And yeah. I know we're, we're at time. So I really appreciate you both coming and talking with me. This has been a really cool conversation. It's um, been really great. Thanks for having us, Nancy. Really refreshing conversation. That's our episode. My thanks to Scott Holman and Ryan Sutter for joining me and to you for listening. Please leave a review for this episode. There is a link in your podcast app. And in it, tell us how your creativity has given you strength when you've needed it most. If you found this conversation valuable, and especially if you know someone who could relate to Ryan's story, please share it with a friend. Thanks so much. If this episode resonated with you, or if you're feeling a little bit less than confident in your creative process right now, join me at The Spark on Substack as we form a community that supports and celebrates each other's creative courage. It's free, and it's also where I'll be adding programs for subscribers and listeners. The link is in your podcast app, so sign up today. See you there, and see you next week. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. 